This is one of the last plays of Shakespeare, and it is glorious because it combines Romeo and Juliet with Richard III, with Midsummer Night's Dream. It is his revenge stories, his comedies, his love stories, all rolled into one. It's kind of the final, perfect Shakespeare. And one of the lines in this story, which I think is so beautifully profound, is we are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. We put together these stories and we wind them around our lives and we bring something to other people, whether it moves them, entertains them, or just takes their mind off of the tempest and turmoil that they live every day. That's our job. In this economic climate, certainly in this cultural climate, to be able to make a story like this is somehow miraculous. I know that when I look back on it, it will be you know, one of the most important experiences of my life. Here's the cool thing about a Julie Taymor film, is it all sounds like it's doable, but a lot of it hasn't been done yet. There is, and I'm gonna use this word, but you can't tell anybody, there's an experimental quality to what we're doing, which is crazy. In the film world, we don't do experimental. We, we don't head into things that we don't know exactly how they're gonna turn out. The idea is from the first shot, it's a believable castle, and then the zoom out is in a girl's hand. We thought first gelatin was the key, but it has to dissolve in her hand during a storm. See it dripping in her face. We tried sugar, but it just doesn't dissolve. We couldn't use any special acids or anything because we've got an actress's skin to deal with. So after all those things, it just turned out that freezing it and using ice as the binder was, was the best solution. You're going to be a star, aren't you? You're going to be a little movie star. But how do we get the thing yeah, to melt please. faster than that? Oh, we're going to thaw them out under the lights a little bit. Okay. So. I, think we, I know you uh -oh. want to go We have rain imminently coming in. Of course, we have rain in the shot, but we're such control freaks, we like to control the rain. We got two left. We haven't had ultimate success yet. And it's terrifying to not know if it's going to work. I guess it's like skydiving, hoping that the parachute part of it happens. And then when it does, it's extremely exhilarating. The theme of The Tempest is nature versus nurture. It's not only in the story, but it's also in the way that I worked and in what my collaborators did, which is absolute nature, the beauty of the real landscapes, the visceral feel of the sand and the elements and the sun and the rain, and then mix in abstract three-dimensional paintings right there in real landscapes. It's a myth in a way, in that the characters are representational rather than completely realistic. So you can't come to The Tempest with a traditional idea of what a film might be about. You've kind of got to see it on a slightly more epic scale. It has this fantastic contrast between good and evil, between the real world and the magic world. You know, it's all about controlling the world, controlling nature. And the winds and the rain and whatever we have, it's going to play in every day because the magic of Prospero, we don't know what's gonna come and go. So we have to flow with whatever that is. It will continue to be challenging, but hopefully we'll have a good time in the running of it. So mahalo, thank you, and on. In 1986, Jeffrey Horowitz of Theatre for New Audience came to me and said, you should do some Shakespeare. I was slightly intimidated by the language. I had acted in Shakespeare. I played Kate in The Taming of the Shrew in college, but I was always a visual director and I just wasn't sure that I could do it. And he said, yes, you can, because the language of Shakespeare is incredibly visual. And I fell in love with the play. But I did it the first time very minimalistically, just a black, volcanic sand rake. And oddly enough, the film, 24 years later, has a lot of the same ideas that I came to, only I set it in a real environment. We have Miranda running over all the territories, black sand, black lava rocks, red earth, green forest. seven or eight years ago. I was on the island of Lanai in Hawaii, and I walked on these incredible red desert landscapes and these giant cliffs and the various forests, and on the big island, these volcanic black rock landscapes. It looks like some supernatural event happened there. I went, this is the island of the Tempest. 
I called the film commissioner they, and they said, no, no, you can't film on Lanai. It's privately owned. I contacted the owner of the island. It turns out that he's a huge Shakespeare fan. And so he allowed us to film on his island. Lanai is a challenge. It's a remote island. There's basically two hotels and we had to ship everything here. I mean, every needle, every pin. We had to use daylight, natural light. We had to stop when it got dark. We couldn't, when we were out there on these dunes and these cliffs, we couldn't carry all these lights. Some of the roads are, are not you know, exactly paved. Our yellow van got stuck, and Val got stuck behind us last night at 11 o'clock. Yesterday, we were in sandstorms and wind, and you know there was fires on the island. A brush fire is of rather large proportion, burning on both sides of the road that we were supposed to travel in the morning. To move everyone from the hotels. Helen Mirren actually conjured up a storm for us for a little while. Yeah, it's raining. It's raining, but maybe not for long. We got lightning. Saw lightning. And that's the big trouble: is shooting outdoors with no cover sets, no time that we just have to shoot anyway. It's day two. It's raining. It's a disaster. The show's on the floor. We're doomed. <laughs> I pray you would lift this sky and open it up, Father God. Mahalo Nui, have a good show and good day. Day four, we're here yeah, on the cliff face. Morning, it's right. going well. I'm understanding now your goal here was to make a movie in the most extreme locations as possible. <laughs> I wanted it to be so difficult. Mm -hmm. It was worth it. This is a side of Hawaii that few really have had a chance to see, and that's going to be a treat to the audience. Look at this. Isn't this not gorgeous? Yeah. Look at, just look at that stuff. But no artist can achieve what nature does by itself, right? Through its own rage. Oh, we just randomly today, because it's just so extraordinary, had the court walking down this black lava rock with these fireworks of, of exploding waves behind them. This is once in a blue moon. You can't plan this sort of stuff. No, because it was never this wild when I've been here. Hot. That was good, thank you. That was good. It was planned by me. <laughs> I was just standing on the rocks looking at the ocean and thinking of some lines I have and you that on the sands with printless foot do chase the ebbing Neptune and then do fly him when he comes back. In other words, the, the little spirit that run after the waves and then run back uh, to avoid the waves when Neptune, the king of the sea, you know, pushes the waves back on shore. And watching these incredible waves here, you can just, those lines absolutely come to life. There's an area which is known as the Garden of the Gods. I've never felt so close to the origins of the planet as I did there. I'm uh, here in uh, the night, I think it's called, doing a bit of acting, called The Garden of the Gods. Not seen any gods yet. People, mostly. It depends what your religious beliefs are, of course. Some say the God is within us all. Oh, you know, the Hawaiians always thought the success to any venture was the spiritual connection that is made. And so we're here to make the connection with all of you. Okay. The rawness and the violence of the nature here, it's fantastical, it's primeval, that is just extraordinary for the play. I can't imagine any corner of the earth that would be more perfect. When you're performing The Tempest on stage, you kind of have to imagine the storm, and then when you're shooting, you're in it. We also had enormous amounts of visual effects to do, and we didn't have a big budget. There was a moment at which this tempest was not to have a tempest, where we were going to build a boat, put it on a gimbal, shoot it in a tank, the way that kind of stuff is often done. It was expensive, and we didn't have a lot of resources. Which always, I think, makes you more creative. Once the set moved to Hawaii, I was able to hook up with some very crafty people there. Uh, actually, the, the prop guy who helped me figure this out started on Hawaii Five-0, which won me over completely, Richard Drake. He did a brilliant job and came up with an idea of building a very small set using reclaimed wood on a raft that we built. She had just this giant PVC pipes that you could buy, that actually we did buy at Home Depot, strapped into the bottom, and we ended up with a very tippy set. 
too many people on there, the whole thing starts to move around and end up in the air and probably sink. So <laughs> let's keep it to 14. We almost capsized the boat on our first tip with the big waves. Everybody was very excited because we were finally doing an action picture. It was the last day in Hawaii. Water coming. What I learned, this being my first shipwreck, what you really need is a lot of rope. Oh! I'm gonna send 300 gallons of water through some windows. I wasn't quite sure what actor I really wanted to do it with. And I went, really, if Prospero were Prospero, does it work? I did see it maybe four years ago, and as I was watching it, I thought, this could be played by a woman quite easily. You wouldn't really have to change very much in the play. And I ran into Helen. I was thinking about it already. Out of the back of my mind, I remembered, you know, watching The Tempest and thinking a woman could do that. She actually said to me, you know, I could play Prospero. And I went, do you want to? But I always imagined that we'd be doing it in the theater. I went, no, in the film. I never kind of expected that. It was just this magical moment that happened. The next step was, is this a trick? Is this a gimmick? It can't be a gimmick, it has to work. So we decided to do a reading and obviously we changed all the he's to she's and the lords to mum. But some of the words are hard to change. For instance, master does not become mistress. It's just, we don't have a word for female that is equivalent to master. So master stayed master. But the main change that we had to do was the backstory. Julie's idea was to animate this moment, to turn it into this stylized uh, series of flashbacks, the Milan sequence. So we started simply with this idea that we would shoot behind plastic. And then in the way that sort of Julie's process works, we added a layer behind that. And we thought maybe we'd print onto plastic some sort of scenery and see if that worked. And as it developed as an idea, it became clear that what we were really going to end up doing was building models, fantastical models, that were forced perspective and skewed and twisted and tortured. And, and from those models, we would shoot plates. And we would take our actors and we would shoot them on the green screen and put them inside the model so that they could actually live inside these spaces. It was a nice blend, sort of old-fashioned, handmade worlds marrying a kind of a high-tech uh, compositing technique. Well, in our version, Prospera was the wife of the Duke of Milan, who was very liberal and very supportive of her studies. But in this era, women were not really allowed to study the sciences, the dark sciences, the white sciences, alchemy. So upon the death of her husband, she became the Duke, which is also a possibility. Women were Dukes. And her younger brother, finding this an opportunity, had her convicted of witchcraft. And she's put on this bark with her daughter and shipped off. Of course, they end up on this island. And 12 years later, the events happen. I think it becomes more of a thing that was done to her gender as much as her person. She always harbors that within her. It's a whole other way of understanding. It's not the old man on the island with the young daughter. This is someone who's really got something to fight for. She's an angry person. She's a bitter person at the beginning of the play. And you don't want to put anger and magic together. You know, that's a rather toxic mix. There's a primal screen. And Julie and I were saying, we can't have a screen. It's too expected. So he heightened and abstracted Helen's voice into a kind of Coltrane-esque saxophone scream. We can relate to a mad jazz player. It's the type of things we were looking for uh, to throw one off kilter, yet achieve the same uh, dramatic role. You know, as they say, beware of what you want because you get it. And when I realized that we were actually going to make this film, of course, I got absolutely terrified and thought, hey, you are crazy. What do you think you're doing? You're never going to be able to do that. I was very, very nervous coming into it. As a woman playing a man's role, I didn't want all the guys to be looking at me going, oh, God, she can't do it, can she? But they were very, very supportive of me and generous, extremely generous. It's always so great when someone you've admired is as great as you would have hoped them to be. She's just tremendous. She's got this kind of youthful energy and she's incredibly professional and, and fun. 
she doesn't take things too seriously. I mean, I would like to be much closer to the edge. She's a trooper. I don't see any fear in her. Just a lot of power. Helen is playing Prospera as a simmering volcano. That's what's there. She is the energy, the magic energy, and the rage, and everything that's boiling up is all being contained. And at a certain point, of course, it explodes. What I love to do is to use the metaphor of the character as the jumping off point for the character's costume. So it's pieces that move down this giant robe as if she is literally the shape of a volcano. That was the biggest challenge of all. It was Prospera's magic cloak. And there's something about having to design a magic cloak that has to sort of summon up everything, be the essence of, of who Prospera is. It was quite a terrifying thing to do. The cloak was described in the script as being made from shards of glass and light. But um, Julie really wanted natural looking glass, more like crystal, the obsidian glass, which is black. The cloak is actually made from quite lightweight vacuum form plastic. There are about four or five basic shapes that were cast, and then 3,000 or so shapes made from each of those pieces in various colors, and then each one sewn on by hand, like the sequins on a ball gown. She has this feeling that there's a lava flow in the design of this raw, rough fabrics that are put together. A lot of the influence for that was Japanese fashion, actually. What ho! Slave! Caliban! What appeared to me in terms of the fact that I, it's, you know, it was such a challenging piece and anything that was Shakespearean, and this is my third or fourth language, and, but I've uh, been born in Africa, I've been raised in France, and then living in America. It's an attribute of Calvin. It's, it reflects a little bit in my own life, you know. And I said, you know, Prospero is Prospera. It's a woman of Helen Mirren's age who is going to be able to control you with her staff. You are clearly more muscular, stronger. You could swat her with your hand and she'd be out, but she has the power because she's a sorceress. Coming from a place like Africa, you know, I've seen uh, a lot of women in that sort of a setting. And then he proceeded to tell these incredible stories of witchcraft and sorcery that he himself had experienced. But you have to snap out of it, yeah? How do you get her curse off of you? You know, I'll go His... back to my yes? culture. Yes, please. She, when she stops, she cancels it. She, she cancels she it. Cancels it. It's so important that this actor didn't have a problem playing with Helen, playing with this prosper, because he knew that there was a reality to that. Then breaks out and said, This island is mine! My cigarettes, my mother, which thou takes from me. You know, it's like somebody knocking on your, you know, at your door in, in your house and say, Oh, that's a nice house. Oh, great. Okay. Now, this is what you're gonna do, <laughs> and this is what you're gonna become, and you know, and um, clean this for me, clean that for me, and uh, this is my home now, you know? And that's part of my passion in wanting to portray Caliban. Cut. Camera's cut, thank you. Cut. One more time, one more time. One Camera's more cut. time. Yeah. Shakespeare is writing about the new world, and he is writing about colonialization. This was a society within which slavery was pretty well accepted. In my original theater version, I used a big mask over the head of Caliban, like a mud man from New Guinea. He just had two eye holes and a mouth hole and ear holes. Well, as I was not gonna cover Jaiman Hansu's face, I had to reconceive the part of Caliban. In this version of Caliban, it's not that he's just a native from that island. I had, in my concept for Caliban, made him also the moon calf, the monster that he has conceived that he's slightly surreal. The image of moon and calf, he's got these splotches like a calf of white skin and black skin. We made the black part of his skin blue-black. It's literally fossilized skin with pieces of volcano and old shells in it. That this boy was born and half of his body was somewhat eaten by lava. He has nature in him. You know, he is the land. He has the one blue eye from his mother, who's the blue-eyed hag Sycorax. He's got webbing between his fingers and long fingernails that can dig the pig nuts. And he says to Prosper, you taught me language. You taught me language. And my prophet is, I know how to curse the Red Plague. Read you for learning me your language. So in his body are carved 
Elizabethan swear words all over his body, and they are raised scars. Make up call, 4 a.m. Oh, yeah. nice. <laughs> See you there. <laughs> it's not funny. It's true. It's not funny. It's true, Jivan. I know, I know. It's true. That's what you said. Oh, this, is, this looks so exciting, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, 4 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning. No, we'll see. We'll oh. see. We'll, we'll try we'll and make it. We'll be there about two seven. Hours. When we first started, it was about four hours. This is pretty, uh, pretty long, but we've gotten it down to a good three hours now. That's three hours with three people working pretty much nonstop. It was difficult to remove myself from the hours of makeup every other day, no matter how composed you were coming in by the end of the, the makeup session, you're on edge. A lot of upkeep on this makeup, just making sure it looks good. It's a lot of poking and prodding all day long. He's got slip on feet that we put on him, you know, for full body shots, but uh, Jaiman's a real sport. Because he has to put up with a lot. You have to go and torture him, you know, put more glue on Diamond. He likes it when I put glue on him. There's nothing about it that was comfortable. Once you're done, you got to take two hours to take it off. It's, it was a lot. So I'll see you later. <laughs> Might as well kiss the clay, right? <laughs> right. The whole thing. But I'm so glad that I uh, went through the experience. I'm so glad that I challenged myself in, you know, doing a uh, Shakespearean piece. Task Ariel and... In a theater when I did The Tempest and my Prospero was a man, my Ariel was a woman. Ariel is a spirit. How do you make a woman, a live actor, be a spirit? A human actor can't rise up, fly around, move around, isn't transparent. In the theater, I solved this by having a mask that was held in the right hand of the actor, and her left hand had a white hand with extended fingers, but the rest of her costume, including her face, was covered in black, in the Bunraku style of hiding the actor. And so you just had this head and this human hand and a little piece of silk that gave life. But it allowed that head to land on the shoulder of Prospero, on the foot of Prospero, to fly in the air. I come to answer thy best pleasure. Be it to fly, to swim, to dive into the fire. I knew I couldn't do this in the film because in the film I wanted to have the benefit of the real human actor and the facial expressions and the nuances that an actor can give. Ah. Is there more toil? And Ben Wishoff at the bill, he's almost rock and roll like little Keith Richards in there. Just to be exact, he looks like an Egger and Sheila painting. He's very thin and had the humor. And if you just saw him as an actor in rehearsal, the sensual and sexual tension between this young in his 20s actor and Helen was really cool. Shh, I'm finally into a cloven fire. Within which rift imprisoned, but it's painfully remain a dozen years. We were rehearsing in London because I had to see what would be the natural relationship. When would they have physical contact? What would be those human moments? Because, of course, Shakespeare writes a spirit with unbelievable human emotions. Do you love me, Master? No? Delicate Does he really mean, do you love me? Or is love so strange? Do you love me, master? I mean, is that what it is? Do you love me, master? <laughs> <laughs> do that again. But right at the beginning when I asked Ben, he'd been working all year and he said, I can't go to Hawaii when you're shooting. I'm free in January. And I, and I thought to myself, can I do this without him on location? But if he's on location, what am I going to do with him? He's just going to be standing on a cliff or standing on a sandbar or in the water. So I decided that that limitation would actually be a virtue. Ariel! What would my place, Master? Here I am. Good. And with Helen, in rehearsal, we would use a tennis ball on a stick. And I'd say, Helen, I'll just move the tennis ball anywhere, and you just watch it. Do you love me, Master? No. I think we have a new concept for Ariel. <laughs> I was getting into it. Yeah. <laughs> then I dispensed with the tennis ball and said, Helen, wherever you look, I'm not going to worry. You focus, you look up there, 
Later, with green screen, I'll make Ariel be there. So we allowed tremendous freedom with her ability to look like this or look round, and, and I would know later. We would have to do, whoosh, we would have to make Ariel move. So there was a lot of complications. Uh oh, how's Ariel going to leave? He doesn't have to leave. Why does he have to leave? He's going to. He's going to be a here. Major in a cost in visual effects. <laughs> in this case. We must get rid of him. Grave spirit. <laughs> And one of my favorite scenes is the two of them in a two shot. He looks like he's underwater. This technique was developed by a wonderful photographer, Brian Oglesby, whose photographs I had seen in a magazine on the airplane. I called him up and I asked him if he would collaborate with us. We had a giant piece of glass that had about two or three inches of water. The glass had a frame and it was floating. That's beautiful. Look, disappear when she just disappeared into darkness. Yeah. <gasps> and we had a rear projection screen at an angle over the glass projecting skies or trees or nature that would make a reflection on the water. And we put the real actor underneath and light him. And Helen was on, <laughs> was not very comfortable, but she was on a diving board with her face over the water, and we could be uh, in a two shot over her shoulder. And what that allowed was that the refractions of the water would break up Ben's face. And he looked like he was not real, that he was made of, of elements. So what Shakespeare suggested, I just did. He was the director, he said, this is what Ariel can do, and frankly, Shakespeare wrote a visual effects piece. A lot of this we did with makeup and props. The harpy, he, he's completely black, black teeth, and giant black wings, and he looks like he's made of oil. And then we made these legs for the harpy, and the lower part of his body is buried in a mountain of shards of glass. And then we were able, with green screen behind, to make more and more of him and have lots of harpies. You are three men of sin. The visual effects are very, very unusual. They're not slick, but they are magical in that sense. I mean, dogs made of lava, and how we did it, you know, we had to really find that way. Action! Somebody come! Ah, ah. When they're in that place. Kyle has worked with me on Titus. He did brilliant work on Across the Universe. And I always wanted a painterly, abstract quality. It's a combination of high expressionistic style, like the early movies of Méliès and Murnau and Lumière, and what filmgoers expect now, which makes them feel like, my god, this is really happening. I boarded the king's ship. Now in the beak, now in the waist, the deck, in every cabin, I flamed amazement. On a 17th century ship, you hear electric guitars heavy metal bass approaches. It takes you out of the uh, quote unquote usual Shakespearean context of hearing something orchestral. It's always throwing a wrench into something, messing with our response to specificity of time. The other thing that would tell you a bit about period would be what Mark Friedberg did with the only interiors. We decided that Prospera's world would be invented as if it said on that island, but outside of the realm of reality that most of the rest of the story takes place in. So we had the black lava, we had this red volcanic uh, landscape and this red dirt and white coral. From those elements, we created an entirely modern uh, structure for her to live in. But the actual cave walls were like an open book. Hopefully it gives the sense that through Prosper's alchemy, she affected the landscape to take on this shape rather than she built it. Looks like a foul bombard that would shed his litter. And then I don't know where to hide my head. Sean Sink! You know, you've got to make that connection. All right. I know not where I'd hide me head. Yon Sink cloud yeah. cannot choose before That's right. Yeah. Ah, you yeah, exactly. bastard! That's what it has to be. Oh, oh Yon Sink right. cloud! Yeah. Shakespeare was a genius. So within the language, there's a kind of poetry that moves you closer to maybe God, if there is a God, and if not God, a unifying spirit that is within us all, that is achieved through high art, where we recognize the things that are beautiful and eternal. In this scene, I play Henry V. In this scene, I play the Moor, consumed by jealousy, 
with Iago constantly turning him against his beloved Desdemona. Finally, he murders her. In this scene, I, Mark Antony, furious at the death of my beloved Caesar, impeach the crowd to revolt against the tyrannical conspirators Brutus et al. In this scene, I am an overreaching Scottish thane with an ambitious wife pushing me on and on to ever more treacherous crimes. Um, <laughs> hold on, wait. In this scene, I play Mercutio. I play the Dane, unable to commit to a decision, but furious with my uncle Claudius. In this scene, and I play Sherlock, a racist, anti-Semitic, stereotyped Jew who wants to trick Lorenzo out of a pound of flesh. I'm going to keep it in there. Russell's an incredibly exciting talent, but who's only done one acted film before. But he's a, a great performer, so he understands the process of performance really well. Still, you have to be vocal and has energy. It still has to be talking to oneself. It's really hard, that, because it, like, it's it's hard, of I know. all the lines in this, this is the line that is most blatantly to the audience. People out there who doesn't exist? Yeah, yeah, because this is what I'm thinking. It's like, where so far have we seen that this is a court jester? Nowhere, really. Like, all that is just, oh, I'm angry, I hate it here, this pisses yeah. me off. This is the best bit for me to go, hello, welcome to yeah. the court of the day. It's like, right. you know, like, I am a court yeah, jester. Yeah. He is a court jester. Speaking You're supposed to be outrageous. Yet. You're supposed to, no one is too sacred to make fun of. That's what the character is and that's what Russell is. On this shoot, Julie Taymor, Helen Mirren, barely a moment passes without me developing either an erection or an Oedipus complex. Sometimes simultaneously. Uh, Trinkle is actually a, a, a nickname because of my love of trinkets, of brightly coloured coloured things, objects, objets, dar, anything really, anything that twinkles, sparkles, anything that a magpie might light its claw upon, that's where you'll find me. If I see something sparkly, even the glint in an eye of a fair maiden, I'm on it. In all my work, I deal with improvisation because it liberates the actor. That literally the actor the takes the essence of what his character is about, they take the story and then they improvise the words. And that means that when they come back to the Shakespeare, they understand the subtext. They're able to make it their own. That moment of when you realize what a prize this could be. I would be rolling in it. I'll make a fortune out of this. Look at him. He's beautiful, disgusting, gorgeous, sexy, weird thing. And then the kind of uh, cynicism about what does make money. I mean, anything make a millionaire there if it's freaky, weird, disgusting, they eat that shit up with a spoon, they love it. They can't get enough freaky, oddity, weird, suppressed, sexual perverts, anything that represents the inner filth they feel within themselves, the perversions made flesh, they love it. I mean, forget it if you're broke, if you're down on your luck, if you're coughing, coughing up blood in a gutter, if you're spluttering and alone and desperate, <laughs> don't look round for help. But, you know, a fetus in a jar, they land over their life savings. I was willing to actually let Russell improvise because probably in Shakespeare's day, the actors who played those roles improvised. It's like Commedia dell'arte. Stefano, is that you? Stefano, if that's you, it's me. Just stay out of the mouth, call... Is that your arsehole calling my name out? <laughs> no, 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 but no, no. Russell ultimately didn't want to do that. He really wanted to do the text as written. Because sometimes his words are quite good, I think. That, oh, I think <laughs> He's so. He's got way with language, that fella. <laughs> I don't know why no picked up on it. <laughs> then I think that he was able to marry those two experiences together. Okay. What about Luke? No, no, no. Like a man? No, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Free joke. <laughs> Free joke for nothing. You've already paid me. It's really good, that rehearsal period, because you don't often get it in films. So I spent that rehearsal period just trying to avoid rehearsing, looking out of windows, uh, stretching chewing gum as long as you can stretch it, then imagining it was a line of energy between two planets that are one day destined to clash, but there'll be lovers on each planet when they meet that brief split second they fall in love and that would be the consummation. That's mostly what I got from the rehearsal process, a sort of cosmic romance. Yeah. So you lost more That'll buttons? Or... This is consistent. Oh. <laughs> the Trinkolo costume was one of the first that I did because I kind of knew immediately what I wanted to do and how it should look and obviously it helped uh, knowing who the actor was, having Russell play Trinkolo. His physicality really played a big part in what I ended up designing for him.
sort of tailcoats, stripes and patterns, tight pants, striped pants that are kind of his style. I, I jumped off of Russell's persona. It's lovely, eh? It's fantastic. It's quite a get-up. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm into it. Russell's no, 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 let it go, let it go. Don't let him go the ocean. Are you trying to do We gave him some really hideous teeth. He was too cute without it. Look at my teeth. I have to wear these teeth in it. So that's like surprising. Because I don't think they're different enough that people are going to go, ooh, they're costume teeth. People are just going to think he's got manky old British teeth. Well, they're cosy teeth, all right? I've got proper Hollywood smile, yeah? Not them Ricky Gervais inward inclining gnashes. Look at that. Leading man teeth, them. You can stake your life on them. I'll chew through anyone. Scarlett Johansson, Natalie Portman, sling them all in this direction. I'll chomp them right up. And then wonderful Alfred Molina is wearing pants that are too small for him, his belly's too big for him, he's wearing a slimy t-shirt. Shakespeare was very specific where the songs went. And there were uh, five songs in this play. The act of singing live on stage, coming out and doing a whole song, was part of the Tempest experience. Sometimes they're uh, almost a thumbnail sketch of a character. When Stefano appears, he sings a body, a shipman's song, and in about four bars, you get the whole character. At one point, someone says, oh, is this not Stefano, my drunken butler? You know, if you're a butler, you're halfway between upstairs and downstairs. Downstairs, you are the king, you are the boss. You're, you're like in the middle of the two worlds, and, and, and there's a great amount of room for pretentiousness and getting ideas above your station. Yeah. As the story progresses, that maybe Stefano, part of the irritation is that he's trying to kind of upmarket himself. <laughs> I think we'll have the Chardonnay tonight. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what I like, yeah. He's Drink one of them old style you. English actors full of anecdotes and stories about anything. Wait till you get him in here, he'll regard you with his charm and tell some sort of story. And you think, well, how's this relevant? How's he coming up with some talk about a meal he had in Tuscany once or someone in a rollerblade accident on Venice Beach? Everything sparkles and whiz bangs with him. Then the cameras go on, suddenly, nothing, boring. No, of course not. That's when he truly comes to life. I feel like I learned to act at his teat. Not physically, that would be weird, because men don't lactate. But, you know, metaphorically, I've drunk a lot of Molina milk. milk Alina. Every time I take I stand a bit further. <laughs> Bump, grab like that. Traditionally, Stefano and Trinculo have always been a kind of double act. On this movie, you know, Russell and I have sort of become uh, chums and we sort of find ourselves colluding with each other. We were trying very hard to appear like a normal comedy double act. I have a good chemistry with him that might go beyond an on-screen double act and hopefully into an off-screen sexual marriage. Give me the live one more time! And you can put some noise on it. Oh, we definitely put some noise on it. I can do my noise. <laughs> okay, go on. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, it's... Felicity was somebody who Julie picked out from a still photograph from many, many actresses. She said, I love the way she looks. I hope she can act. Wherefore whip you at mine unworthiness, which dare not offer what I decide to give and much less take. What I shall die to want. Cut! That was good. Woo! Shakespeare has, I think, tried to personify that thing you have when you're really young, that complete naivety, but not in an annoying way, in a way that is quite sad, is that as we get older, it gets lost. You know, she's incredibly beautiful, but she's also extremely clever. And, you know, you need that to a certain extent with Shakespeare because the language can be quite complex. When I suddenly realised that I would be attempting to do Shakespeare on screen with Helen Mirren. Right, OK. <laughs> Where do I start? What is it? A spirit? No, child. Julie actually found me as a musician, so that's, that's how I got into this. It wasn't from uh, acting at all, so I, I hadn't really... It wasn't part of my plan to become an actor, actually.
I saw him perform with his band Carney. He had this most extraordinary princely feel about him. There's a refined elegance, vulnerability, rocker, masculine, feminine, that just felt so right for Ferdinand. I studied a little in high school, but I definitely never performed Shakespeare, let alone really any form of acting. And he came and auditioned next to some very famous people who, if I say their names, people are going, oh my god, you didn't pick. I didn't, because he gave the best audition. I felt sort of guilty on one end, getting this part as Ferdinand. There's so many actors who would have probably killed to get a part like this, and I didn't have to kill anyone to get it, so that was kind of nice. Well, what was great about his audition was he believed in love at first sight. My prime request, which I do last pronounce, is you wonder if you'd be made or not. You could see it in his, in his face, in his eyes, that there was no cynicism there. And it's very hard for people in their late teens or early 20s to think about that kind of love, love that you would die for. But you, oh you, so perfect and so peerless, a creature of every creature's best. And his acting was incredibly natural. It wasn't artificial. He wasn't frightened of it. it. He made the Shakespeare sound like contemporary language. I see Ferdinand as someone who is determined and gentle at the same time. I don't see him as a weak person, but at the same time, he has that soft side that is able to allow Miranda in and fully fall in love. Just, it's been very natural. It's almost like a brother, sister, it's a sibling sort of relationship that we have. Oh, is that, is that like the, yeah. Which hopefully translates into a romantic relationship on the screen. I'm assuming that sometimes it can get all mixed up, co-stars falling for one another, but uh, not that she wouldn't be an easy girl to fall for, but in this situation, it, it was very comfortable, and um, I, I don't think either one of us felt uncomfortable at any time with any things we had to do. Who thinks there is no more such shapes as he, having seen but him and Cal it's her mum's time to say, you know, there are loads of guys around. But obviously, if it's the first one you've ever seen, you might be more inclined to falling in love with him, which she does. I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but I had never read The Tempest. So when I found out that Prospero was originally a man, I was actually quite disappointed. A mother's love is very different than a father's love. Yes, Prospero is very protective of his daughter, but when Ferdinand comes, there's a little bit of that daddy competition thing with the young prince coming to take his 16-year-old daughter. It's not about competition with, with uh, Prospera. It's about truly testing Ferdinand to see if he is worthy of her. Dishonor on the go while I sit lazy by. No, don't would back up, me just As well as it does you, and I feel much more at ease. For my goodwill is to it, and yours is against. Where are you going? I don't know. <laughs> when we were trying to find a place for the two lovers, Miranda and Ferdinand, to have their real love moment, what we found was a gorge, an incredible red, beautiful sunset gorge. And yours it is against. <sighs> it was the essence of what was going on there, that they just can't get, there's nowhere else they can go but to each other. Poor worm, thou art infected. This visitation shows it. And that's how she sees the two lovers, her daughter down there, that she's infected with love. You know, Shakespeare can be cynical about love, but he can create characters that are completely non-cynical about it. Oh, mistress mine, where are you roaming? Because Reeve was such a great singer, I thought, oh, can't we have a love song? So we took a song from Twelfth Night. Oh, Mistress Mine was uh, originally used as sort of an older guy ogling a younger lady. A dirty old man song, basically. In this, the same exact lyrics take on a whole different hue. He's singing uh, about the ephemeral quality of time, and, and we don't have much time comes across as a seduction, but a teenage seduction. I saw her standing there. It's a very f a famous Beatles song. She was just 17, and you know what I mean, you know? It's OK if it's a 19-year-old singing that. But if it's a 65-year-old person singing it, she's a, just 17. Oh, man, it's a different thing. So you can see how one lyric can take on another hue, depending on the situation that he's in. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. 
Merchant. And Tom. And Chris. And Alan. And David. Gosh, it really does look like we're walking <laughs> forward, yeah. <laughs> For me, it was an interesting challenge because Julie isn't setting the film in any particular period, but she did have a sort of few specific requests. Julie's reference for the Milan court was Velasquez and Goya and that darkness. And the look then, the Spanish fashion of the time, actually influenced the rest of Europe. I mean, it was very dark, very black, very somber, intimidating, if you like. And the only decoration really is very linear and usually in gold or silver braid. The other side of, of Julie's brief was that although Valesco was an uh, inspiration, we weren't setting it in the 17th century, it was somewhere now, it was contemporary, it had to have a modern feel. The beauty of what Sandy did was she used zippers, silver zippers as all of the details. It just came to me that it would provide a really good way of doing decoration, strong, yet still look like a period costume. We entirely bought out a store in the East End of London. Well, I mean, there must be miles of zippers involved. Sandy Powell is, is a tremendous artist. She does these costumes. Much as they are beautiful, they're kind of hellish to wear. <laughs> and then I had a bit of a panic about the weather because we got here and, of course, it's hot. I became like some character of a Jane Austen novel. I had a kind of an umbrella and, and it really was hot yeah, because we're on all this volcanic you know, there was no shade and I'd be wearing black, tweedy black leather. Yeah, that was the worst thing about it. It was kind of weird though, because it's not a big budget film, but we were shooting in Hawaii and we were staying in a Four Seasons. We're working, honestly, we're discussing... We're the, discussing we're how discussing, to get into character. We're discussing um, the verse. Yeah. But, you know, it wasn't too bad. Even a couple of the times, it was cool, and they kept doing it. Let me catch you before you went out. What? The shoes. <laughs> I think we can get away with that. <laughs> it's a great group of the four of us because they're all so very different, and the characters are all so very different. It was great to get Chris Cooper and David Strathairn. David has done Shakespeare, but Chris did it because he'd never done it. When we talked to Chris at first, he was, uh, you know, you sure you want me? My, my British accent isn't really, you know, isn't really up there. And, and Julie said, absolutely, I'm, I believe you can do it. And uh, kind of talked Chris into it. I freaked out when I heard that he was going to play Antonio. It doesn't even feel like acting when you're with someone who's just there and, and fascinating and just and he's such a sweetheart as well kind of shy and but i just i, I just love to make him laugh you know he's one of these people that when you <laughs> when you get a laugh out of him you feel like whoa i got you know he laughed welcome audience here we are ironwood forest scene 33 20 shots behind battling with the weather usual things this is where the um sebastian and antonio plot to kill the king Prosper allows the nature of these characters to come out. My brother Sebastian is vulnerable to lots of influence and he falls under Antonio's spell. I, I think of this as a tango. There is a masculine and a feminine, but it's... And yet, methinks I see it in thy face what thou shouldst be. That it has a bit of a... It just in rhythm. To perform an act whereof what's past is prologue, what to come in yours and my discharge. With a lot of plot lines in Shakespeare, all of a sudden, you just suddenly think, oh, I'm going to kill my brother. And, you know, you, there's no real build-up. It's like in Richard III in that scene where he's just killed this woman's children and then within about two pages she's going to marry him. And yet you buy it. So what I try to do is make Sebastian a bit dim, the slightly dimmer brother. What stuff is this? How say you? Say this were death that now hath seized them. I kind of sort of thought of him as Prince Andrew and with, with uh, David being Prince Charles. Because you can't really play evil all the way through. And also, I mean, you kind of, look, I'm kind of already a little, you know, arch. Hello. What Shakespeare does so beautifully is he mirrors that conspiracy with another clown conspiracy where Caliban tells them that they can become the leaders and the king of this island if they'll only kill Prospera. Oh, 
every fertile inch of the island, and I will kiss thy foot. I pray thee, be my God. Come on. Then. That's when you see yeah. his pure nature. You know, he's like that little innocent child who would team up with anybody to just, you know, get his island back. I'll take you here, yes. and I'll and I'll and I'll dig you. I'll this is where the Bhutto face. thing can come in really okay. well. Or I'll dig the young yeah. penis, or I'll. Dig. And we see his physicality. You marvel at his physicality. We always think of movies as very naturalistic. But we are doing Shakespeare, which is heightened language. So there's possibility, like when you, when you were moving the other day, you know what I was saying? You're all like you're all tottering and top heavy. Yeah. Sort of little tiny feet and too much weight near the top. If it comes from a source of fear, and you just push it and extend it and multiply it, you can make it work. But this puppy headed monster, you just go, oh, why is he all right? And then you go from being all light and playful and then suddenly it's menacing, it's, it's, uh, it's horrible. It's because it's like, it lures you into thinking, oh, this is someone you can just take the piss with and he's just like a little kid. And then it's, oh, it's not very nice. <laughs> what happens to your face when you do that? An incredible mask. Jaiman studied Bhutto with Master Oguri in L.A. Bhutto is a powerful and shocking contemporary Japanese dance form that has an appreciation for the grotesque in nature. It's like a curse, isn't it? You come in here, thou pied ninny thou, and you do that thing, and he's like, what the fuck is that? What is that? And then you, you poor could, monster. poor monster, you know, it's monstrous, but then you could actually break out of it. That's the fun part. That's where you can make it, which is. What, what are you doing vocally at that sound? I'm doing oh, a is. voice like Caliban. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You see how he mocks me. No, oh, how so he mocks me. He's kill you now. Yeah, yeah, right. You want to do a Neapolitan, an Italian accent? I should like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Do your, do your low-life Italian accent. I will, uh, Instantly. <laughs> Well, as you know, I suppose it's a little bit slimy, a little bit disgusting, but also a sense of beauty and awareness of cool things, but more rat-like and more disgusting. It's more Greek. <laughs> this is really a location that um, originally we were going to have them walking through the water, but unfortunately the water turned out to be 27 times the legal limit for bacteria. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Delicious here. I shall come here for my holidays. We've got a little pool here full of fresh water that we can have Trinculo falling into. Um, we're just standing in. Uh, well, you know, ADs are expendable. And we're about uh, two hours behind. You didn't mention this in our first meeting. One! What Ariel? You forgot your words. Bang them and hang them. Bang them and hang them. Hang them and bang them. Fault is free. Confuse and abuse them. <laughs> That's one of my actual policies. <laughs> Flay them and spray them. <laughs> fly them and fly them. Fly them and fly them. Fault is free. What, what is this saying? Thou beest the man, show thyself. Caliban, although he's earthbound, his language is very, very, very poetic. The isle is full of noises. This is his famous aria of words. Sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. The uh, music is also uh, additional landscape on the movie. The underscoring really is coming from the ideas of the island. To achieve that, we used uh, various instruments, uh, shokahachi, Japanese flute, recorded in such a way that air and music are inseparable. The whole thing was to be an unusual tapestry where you can't put your finger on it or define it as a particular type of music. At a certain point, and I think it's the most beautiful point in The Tempest, Prospero asks Ariel how fares the king and his followers. And Ariel says that they are made mad, and if she could see them her herself, she would feel compassion for them. Your charm so strongly works them that if you now beheld them, your affections would become tender. 
Dost thou think so, spirit? Mine would, master. Were I human? That's like one of the turning points. And even in the film, it's the one moment where I allowed the actor to be physical, where he's not transparent, where he's actually almost human there with Prospera. And she recognizes that her vengeance and her dark powers have taken her one step beyond where she should be. Ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes and groves. One of the great speeches, Ye Elves of Hills, she talks about how she's conjured all of this magic and now she's going to release it. You demi puppets that by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make. It is actually a direct ripoff, almost plagiarism, but Shakespeare was the best at this, of Ovid's Metamorphosis, and those words came out of the witch Medea's mouth. Now, that was pretty astounding, that it actually, the words were originally coming from a sorceress. Three, two, one. And in this beautiful story, which is very contemporary, it's about compassion and forgiveness. Not just revenge, which we all love in the movies and we all love in the theater, but at a certain point, it's also about giving up that power and understanding that there's a certain point where we become transgressors, where we've gone too far and we've allowed it to eat ourselves. And we know that, the cycle of violence just, and vengeance just continues and continues and continues. To the dread rattling thunder have I given fire and rifted Jove's stout oak with his own bolt. In articulating these speeches and therefore having to think them through, you know, you do go through a sort of religious experience. You know, they are so deep and so beautiful. The language of the play tends to pull you into a kind of a, a poetic speaking which really doesn't work for film. I think that's always the, the struggle with Shakespeare on film, to make it sound relevant and naturalistic and modern, but not to betray the language. But this rough magic I hear abjure. When she gets dressed in her costume from the Milan court from the past, it had to be really strikingly different. It had to really show the difference in her life back then to her life now on the island. Showing the restrictions and the constrictions of, uh, of, of wearing corsetry. And... This is called my um, bondage Cinderella. Yes. <laughs> right, you want to get the torture chamber in. The image that Julie had early on of Ariel tightening the bodice, the clothes alone are like a prison. We should, yeah, we should see it actually, oh. the last pull in. They'll have to use the real laces for so that. That means you'll actually have to see someone behind me. Yeah. You can, you can act, act it, act it. Yes, I'll have to act. Behold, the wronged Duchess of Milan, Prospera. I bid a hearty welcome. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> Camera's cut. Very hearty welcome. <laughs> so through this interchange with Ariel, she understands that it is time for her to release her enemies because they've been punished, and she releases her power at the same time. I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound. I'll drown my book. The last speech of Prospera is usually done to the audience. And I had cut it from the screenplay because I thought, oh, what is she going to do? Just speak to the camera and say all of that? We've already heard her. But when I came to the end of the edit and it all ended just with this breaking of the staff and throwing her books into the water, I felt it wasn't complete. And, and uh, Julie was very adamant, you know, you thought your work was done, go back to work. I want to last speech to be composed as a song. It was never uh, intended to be a song by Shakespeare. So Eliot took that beautiful speech, now my charms are all o'erthrown, and what strength I have's mine own, which is most faint. And he set it to music. I thought, what artist? Until I thought of uh, Beth Gibbons.
Her work with a porter's head is incredibly famous, but the sound of her voice had this timeless, ageless quality of vulnerability, and that's low register is just, just gorgeous. So it became a seven minute long end titles piece, and it really rounds out and completes the movie. Consider Shakespeare was fashioning possibly his last play. He knew that he was going to leave the stage as an actor. And at the end, he steps out, Shakespeare. He recites an apology, basically. Forgive me if I didn't entertain. With your applause, fill my sails with a breeze. I'll be set free. The most important word in that final speech is the word free. It's repeated a number of times. And if you think about the whole play, the most important word is free. My Ariel, chick, that is thy charge. Then to the elements be free. Freedom! Heine! Heine! Freedom! Freedom! Heine! Heine! Freedom! Heine! Freedom! 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 This has been an extraordinary experience through the rain, the fire, the wind, the mud. It's been an amazing experience for all of us. It's all there, which is even through all the rock and roll, it's all there. We've been working as a team. Everybody has had to make their sacrifices and everybody has kind of had to do things on difficult circumstances. Uh, but they've all been troopers and they all have come through. That's, that's, I put my hats off to the crew, the talent, everybody on this production. I think it is the most extraordinary cast I've ever had. You get the high and the low, the sacred and the profane, all smattered and colliding together. Extraordinarily accomplished actors in, you know, often, sometimes playing quite, quite small roles. You end up with a cast of actors who, who really want to be here, you know, who really want to be right here, right now, doing this, and that creates its own kind of wonderful energy. And they all happen to be really nice people. Julie said, we're all going to be on an island together. Let's cast, number one, the best actors for the role. Number two, people you'd want to spend time with on an island. <laughs> I think it's a testament very much to the material at hand. But I also think it's a great testament to the trust and, and uh, respect that people have for Julie Taymor and for her work and, and, and how she works. You know, I don't think you get casts together like this without there being some kind of desire on their part to, to, to be here, to do it, you know. You know, she has a very powerful imagination and, and this play of all the plays allows that imagination to go wherever you want it to go. She's got a great way of turning what might seem on paper as a kind of rather intellectual idea into a very exciting visual thing that just, just opens up the story, you know. For a person in my job, it's exhilarating to be at the forefront of the telling of the story. It feels like being an artist working with her, and I like it. Your hair is short. No, it's it's exact same length. It's exactly the same length as when we started. Tensions grew high on set when Julie Taymor's fastidious observation of continuity spilled into tyranny. <laughs> These people. It's really interesting working with a director who is also a designer. And particularly knowing that Julie's background is theatre, it meant that I was allowed to sort of push the boundaries a little. And I think that's what she was expecting of me, was to sort of go a little bit further than you would do if you were just designing costumes for a film or a period film. So, I mean, really, it was a fantastic opportunity to be, you know, given that freedom to go as far as I, I think I could go. The experience of doing it has been huge, huge. You can always tell when a director really loves the material, and so that, you know, feels great when you're working with somebody who really has such a, an understanding of every aspect of what you're working on. There aren't too many people who really, uh, you know, challenge themselves at taking on a Shakespearean piece. This, this combination of, of, of styles, this combination of elements, you know, in, in Shakespeare's plays, particularly in this one, there was never any fear of combining all those things. He was 
dark, he was funny, he was, he's forever contemporary. He's more daring than most writers. He's outrageous and he's deep. There's nothing better. What makes him so brilliant, I think, is that if you look, you always find yourself there. It's always exciting to be working on a project that you think is trying to achieve something different rather than the same boring formulaic stuff that is churned out year after year. And hopefully, you know, bring these incredible plays to yet another generation. We don't actually have the vocabulary, the way of speaking that is quite as visually rich and lush and full of emotion. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. And that is a wrap for today. Thank you very much. My God. Well done.